And one of our proud partners is, is UCL, um, and we're thrilled to be partnering with UCL Culture, and in particular the art collection, the art museum, in today's event. I'm going to ask Dr. Nina Perlman to tell us a bit about the art museum and a bit about the exhibition. Um, and after that, the private view will be talked through by the curator, Dr. Richard Tours from UCL, and it will be followed by a short performance reading by Nicholas Anderson. So over to you, Nina. Thank you, Bav, and thank you to Knowledge Quarter, and um, thank you all for joining us. And so, as Bav said, we thought it would be a good idea to start with some context uh, about what it is that we do at UCL Art Museum. And um, that will be my part. Um, and um, about the why we do what we do, I hope that that will be revealed as we progress. But uh, suffice to say, I suppose, is that we want to make the material heritage of the university relevant. And that means relevant to people, relevant to new ideas, and relevant to innovation. Um, my colleague Andrea Fredrickson and myself at the Art Collections have spent uh, many years experimenting with the best ways to do this. And um, we do this with the artistic heritage of the art muse of the university, as I said. Um, but, um, and Andrea is uh, the Art Collections curator, and she works closely with our academic colleagues and our students, and with the wider higher education community. Um, and she curated Witnessing Terror together with or in partnership with Richard Tours, with David Bindman and with College Colin Jones. I understand that both Colin and David are with us in the audience today. And um, Andrea and myself are actually part of a larger team at UCL, which is called UCL Culture. And this is a group of people uh, with diverse set of expertise and networks. And we are tasked with helping the UCL community um, share its work with the, or connect its work with the campus, with the museums. We have three of these. We also have a theater. Um, but more importantly, it's to, the aim is to connect the work uh, with the wider world beyond UCL. And um, we do this in collaboration. Collaboration is key to everything that we do. And the history of the art collections is tied to the history of the Slade School of Fine Art. And our site, uh, our museum site, which is a traditional print room, some images of which you, uh, glimpses of which you'll get from Richard's presentation, is uh, actually a gateway to a vast and stored collection. And within it is 150 years of work by emerging artists, which was collected through a system of prizes that started in the 19th century and continues to this day. And alongside this collection is a historic collections themselves spanning 500 years. And um, these came to the university um, by way of donations or bequests uh, from philanthropists from the 19th century to the present day. And what they all shared is their um, enthusiasm or belief uh, for the educational use of art collections. And the latest in these donations came to us in 2016. And some of the work or parts, of, uh, some, some of this collection uh, is featured in the exhibition, Witnessing Terror and uh, alongside uh, loans and commissions. And um, this is actually what Richard is here to talk to you about. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Nina. So yeah, we're gonna pass over to Richard Tours, who's the curator. I'll just say a few words about Richard um, before I pass it over to him. So he specializes in European visual cultures of the 18th and 19th centuries with an emphasis on the period of the French Revolution. Um, he's taught previously at McGill University in Canada and has written, written several, several books. So thank you so much, Richard. We're thrilled to have you um, and over to you now. Great. Um, thank you. And um, well, thank you to the Knowledge Quarter and thank you all for coming. I hope you're all well. Um, uh, 
I was one of the curators of the exhibition, as Nina's already mentioned, with, uh, with Andrea and with David Byman and Colin Jones and with, with Nina. And it was loads of fun working on this exhibition. So I'm so glad to have the chance to tell you a bit about it while it's um, uh, had to close. So this is a really great opportunity, I, I think, from my perspective. I'm going to talk through some of the show's main themes and then I want to show what I think are some of my favourite exhibition uh, images from the exhibition that I've, I've drawn out of, of some of those that are on display. So the period of the French Revolution that's uh, known as the Terror or the Great Terror, uh, the dates of which vary depending on who you ask, but for our purposes lasted from 1792 to middle of 1794 gave rise to many of the most memorable and dramatic images of this crucial moment in, in modernity. And these images were central to revolutionary attempts to regenerate in a, the terms of the revolutionaries themselves, they use this word regenerate all the time, all aspects of life from clothing and speech through to money and maps and to even remake time itself. And in our contemporary political context in which terror has taken on a variety of disturbing meanings, um, no more so than at the moment, and in which the proliferation of images plays an increasingly significant role in how we comprehend acts of state or political violence. It seems ever more important to examine this radical period in French history. And um, in fact, some of you may have seen these remarkable images that have been going around on social media in the last few days of, of protests in Louisville, Kentucky on the 28th of May, and um, protesting against the extrajudicial murder of Breonna Taylor by police. And here we see the statue of Louis XVI, the King of France, uh, until 1792, having its hand removed by a protester, a really powerful iconoclastic gesture. And, Louis was executed during the terror in January 1793, and this statue was sent to Louisville uh, in the 1960s, having been commissioned by his surviving daughter in the 1820s. So it's a really compelling and I, I think very complex example of how revolutionary politics, um, both the implementation of state terror and forms of resistance to it, the treatment of images and objects, and the legacies of European colonialism might reverberate through the ages. Uh, so tracing the tumultuous uh, period from the trial and execution of Louis XVI through to the fall of Maximilien Robespierre, one of its uh, key architects, Witnessing Terror includes a range of printed images representing key events and personae, from portraits of revolutionary martyrs through to dramatic scenes of Parisian crowds. These prints give us some kind of insight into how people understood life during this, uh, this period. Now, why prints? Well, prints were able to be distributed, uh, made and distributed far more quickly than other media could be. For instance, paintings or sculpture, which often took a really long time to make or uh, had to be adapted or the particular people represented fell out of political favor very quickly. So prints were a much more flexible medium um, with which to reach large numbers of people and to convey the message of, of the revolution. So um, as well as a number of caricatures, street scenes, and some more overtly artistic prints, the exhibition displays a number of uh, more everyday objects, such as paper money, passports, posters, and playing cards. And trying to draw out the contemporary relevance of this revolutionary iconography, witnessing terror, also shows some works by the conceptual artist and poet Ian Hamilton Finlay that engages with the long-term legacy of the terror, one of which you can see on the wall here in the exhibition, and I have a, um, a slightly sharper shot here from the, his gallery. Um, here in a translation of a line from Chenier, a line of thin pale red, Finley refers to André Chenier, a poet who, despite having written several poems in support of the revolution, was guillotined in July 1794, just days before the end of the terror. Um, it's a real, one of the really tragic stories of the French Revolution. Um, and in this work that was made in 1989, um, the time of the bicentennial of the French Revolution, um, we see scarlet and white neon forming a, a homage to the executed poet that, in fact, riffs on a quotation from the poet Stéphane Mallarmé. Uh, the line of red here refers to the 
the guillotine as well as to the the red ribbons that were um, uh, apocryphal, but they were worn around the necks of uh, those who'd lost their loved ones to the to the blade. And the terror remains a vexed term that for many has become synonymous with the uh, French Revolution, uh, clouded by myths that emerged in the years that follow. Um, in fact, it wasn't a new word uh, in the French Revolution. Um, and it in fact had positive associations, which isn't something we perhaps might think of nowadays. Um, it was associated with a salutary terror, a cleansing terror, something that might change or reform the body politic, uh, regenerate it in, in new ways. So it drew upon various forms of medical discourse um, and the etymology of this, this term, and it was very familiar by this point. Um, and also religious discourse, God's terror on earth as something that could that can change people's people's lives. So so when we you know we hear Robespierre in February 1794 saying that terror is nothing more than speedy, severe, and inflexible justice. It's thus an emanation of virtue, which seems really the wrong way around, that terror would be something that's virtuous. It makes a certain amount of sense in terms of the sort of backstory of this, this term. The terror was a system of political institutions and practices, and it was accompanied by new rhetorical and cultural strategies. It didn't happen overnight. It developed as a tactical response to military crises rumors and fears and images played a crucial role in the terror as well as in its subsequent representation and i think it's one of the real paradoxes of this period that this time that's characterized by increasing state repression by misogyny by um, uh, taking away people's rights by uh, summary executions is also a period that's incredibly culturally rich that leads to all kinds of um, really radical transformations in how people understand, understand the world. So this exhibition asks what it means to witness terror then and now. And as a really important strain of the exhibition, it features um, extracts from some recently discovered letters by Catherine Anasandre Rouget, uh, the Duchesse d'Elbeuf, who um, maintained a correspondence with an unknown friend throughout the revolution. Um, Elberth's uh, letters have been uh, recently discovered in the, in the police files in the French National Archives by Professor Colin Jones, one of the co-curators of this exhibition. And it's the subject of an, an ongoing uh, research project at Queen Mary and, and at Exeter. And I, I recommend you go to the, the website, Revolutionary Duchess, um, .exeter.ac.uk, where you can find out more about the project. And Nicola Baldwin will also be um, saying some more about that towards, towards the end. Um, Elba lived right at the center of, uh, of Paris and the Place du Carousel, so had this privileged view over many of the events that happened during this, during this period. And uh, uh, she was an aristocratic woman, um, so in many ways her uh, sensitivities were totally against the revolution, but it's an archive uh, that gives us an entirely new way into thinking about the, um, uh, what it means to, to witness um, uh, these unprecedented uh, events. The exhibition uh, begins with portraits. The terror was a dramatic response to attacks on the revolutionary government from within and without France. And uh, it was a response to a desire of other European powers to suppress the revolution. And the imminent prospect of invasion uh, was something that haunted revolutionaries and, and led to a determination to keep control. Um, and this led both royalists and revolutionaries to, to create martyrs, to rally sentiment, to stigmatize their enemies as killers of one kind or another. And royalists had um, obvious martyrs in the French king and queen, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, um, but there were others too. Uh, Charlotte Corday, the assassin of the radical journalist, Jean-Paul Marat, um, Marat himself, and the great revolutionary artist, Jacques-Louis David, was commissioned to create a series of paintings of revolutionary martyrs, most notably that of, of David, to be a constant reminder to legislators of sacrifice in the name of liberty, equality, and fraternity. And here he is, our, our cover star for the exhibition, um, Jean-Paul Marat, um, 
a very emotional print. Um, and it's one of two uh, incredibly striking images that are made by uh, David at this time to commemorate um, Marat's uh, murder by, by, by Corday. Marat was one of the principal supporters of the radical Jacobin faction, which was on the rise during the, uh, during the terror. Um, and here David, who David himself was a fervent revolutionary. He was a regicide. He voted for the death of the king. So there's this really interesting integration of art and politics uh, via his character. He shows Marat as, a, as like a Christ-like figure, um, dying for the, for the ideals of the revolution. Um, in fact, Marat was very ill at this time and probably would have died anyway shortly after had he not been uh, stabbed in his bath. And he was a rather unpleasant character, but here he is shown as this, uh, this idealized uh, saintly, saintly figure, almost in a sort of Pieta pose. On the other hand, his uh, assassin, uh, Charlotte Corday, um, was a supporter of the moderate Girondin faction, whose leaders were guillotined in October 1793 and was more divisive. Um, the Duchesse d'Elbeuf described her as, in her diary as an Amazon, as a perfect philosopher of our times. Um, but others who supported the revolution were far more negative about her. Um, she was um, frequently described as being monstrous, as, uh, uh, as some kind of uh, hyena. Um, here she is um, with her hair cropped close, um, as if in preparation for the guillotine, but also with a, uh, with a rather sort of stately countenance on her face, that she's going to her fate um, with some degree of um, um, uh, acceptance. Um, so this is a, um, a, you know, a, more, a more ambivalent image, perhaps, of, of, a, of a political martyrdom. Perhaps more explicit is something like this, uh, an image of uh, Michel Lepletier de saint who who is a, uh, an unusual thing, an aristocrat who voted for the death of Louis XVI. Um, and this sort of more heroic funerary image of Le Pelletier shows how prints could be um, really useful in promoting an idea of revolutionary martyrdom, just in the way that the Catholic Church had distributed images of Christian martyrs to encourage uh, a kind of respect for sacrifice. And it's also an amazing print with this sort of um, um, uh, amazing sort of marbled background, which is, which is really interesting in terms of the technical properties of the, the image itself. Now we've seen him already, Louis the Sixteenth at, at Louisville, but um, here he is uh, uh, during the Revolution, um, and this is a print that refers to a real, real event in June 1792, when a group of revolutionaries stormed the Tuileries Palace, confronted Louis the Sixteenth, and forced him to wear the bonnet rouge, this um, red bonnet, the symbolic headwear of rav radical revolutionaries and the, the cockade, the, the tricolor rosette that um, symbolized one's allegiance to the revolution. And this was a really decisive stage in the downfall of Louis XVI that he's formally deposed in August 1792 and then executed in January 1793. But what's really, you know, there are two things I think that are really interesting about this image. The first is that it's uh, actually a royal portrait that's been adapted and appropriated as a cheaper etching um, but with this revolutionary symbolism added in terms of the, uh, um, the, the bonnet rouge. Um, so it shows revolutionaries playing with the, the signs of kingship and doing something quite different with them. Um, but it's also really interesting in terms of the material properties of the image, because this blue background here is actually a, is a backing to the image. It's been cut out around Louis XVI's uh, profile and uh, his, his around his body and it's, it seems to have been folded at either side so we think it's probably been folded back on itself and propped up and used for some kind of target practice or shadow play or some kind of children's entertainment possibly but we can't really recuperate that but what we can recuperate is that this is an image that's been participated in. It's been it's been manipulated. It's been used, and it's been it's been played with. These aren't just objects of passive consumption. They're being they're part of everyday experience in a really tangible way. Um, um, quite a different register here. 
Maximilien Robespierre, the, uh, um, the, the leader of the uh, Jacobin um, faction during the, during the terror and in many ways its key ideologue. Um, and here we have a portrait and a vignette and also a biography and text. Many of the images we're showing here combine image and text in really compelling ways. And I, I think that's why Ian Hamilton Finley's work is interesting too, because he has this conceptual artist's attention to the relationship between those, those things. And just to read you a little bit of the biography here, Robespierre is described as an execrable tyrant whose dominant passions were pride, hate, and jealousy. Nothing could quench his thirst for human blood. And the text documents his appearance in this, again, in a very highly partisan tone, um, saying this monster lived 35 years. His height was five feet, two inches. He had a querulous physiognomy with a livid and bilious com complexion. Um, so not nice at all. Um, and I thought I'd show this briefly as well, because this is a passport that's um, one of these more everyday objects that we've included that was issued in 1799. And it also functions as a kind of portrait relating the name and age of the woman to which it, it was issued and her height, her hair, her eye and eyebrow color with spaces sort of on the document to describe aspects of her appearance, such as her forehead, her nose, her mouth and her chin. And every checkpoint she passed, she would have been uh, marked as having been seen and a stamp would have been affixed uh, to, the, to the document. So this is a, a really interesting thing to look at if we're thinking about witnessing and what it means to witness a person during the, the terror. And you know, some key figures, someone like the Duchesse d'Albeuf, for instance, we don't have portraits of her, but we have her name appearing in various places on lists of emigres um, and in other um, more bureaucratic uh, documents from the from the period. And these passports are interesting because they, they show the, the kind of ambivalence that revolutionaries had to this kind of documentation. On the one hand, it's against freedom of movement. On the other hand, it was representative of a move to a more, um, uh, more state surveillance at this time that was necessary to ensure the survival of the revolution. From April 1792, revolutionary France was a at war with much of the rest of Europe and their increased fears of invasion. Um, and political legitimacy was no longer certain and those who resisted popular sovereignty were at risk of suspicion as counter-revolutionaries. So terror was thus implemented as, on the one hand, a policy, and on the other hand, a set of institutions to intimidate and punish purported en enemies of the Republic. So, power at this time effectively was de devolved into the hands of spontaneously formed revolutionary committees. The Committee of Public Safety, established in 1793, um, with the primary executive power, with responsibility for the war effort. A Committee of General Security oversaw the implementation of the terror, while the feared revolutionary tribunal became the seat of justice punishing crimes against the revolution. And there are two important things that happen at the moment that are characteristic of the terror. Um, in September, 1793, the National Convention passed a law of suspects, ordering the arrest of all enemies of the revolution. And this was extended in June, 1794, um, with a law that required all suspects prove their own innocence. So what this did was it reduced any sentence to one of death, or acquittal, liberty or death, no gray area in between whatsoever. Executions, as we probably all know, were carried out by guillotine, a method that was considered more humane and equitable. And from the start, the French Revolution produced a flood of paper to sustain these new bureaucracies and transmit its new symbolism. And this became more pronounced by 1793 as this radical imagery of the terror was reproduced on diverse official documents as well as on everyday objects. In this image by Baboulet, we see the denunciation of conspirators within one of the offices of the Revolutionary Committees uh, or Surveillance Committees. Um, there's a crate of foreign wine you can see in the, in the middle here, which suggests that these men have actually pilfered the possessions of suspect aristocrats, and some actually are dressed in revolutionary garb, which um, alludes to the idea that counter-revolutionary behavior might be something that could occur amongst those who ostensibly even supported the revolution. 
And on the far wall, I hope you can see the bust of Jean-Paul Marat overseeing proceedings. And on the right, shelves with boxes containing bureaucratic documents and previous judgments. And over the door, the words liberty or death are inscribed. And in this dark political climate, anyone could be uh, a suspect. And actually, this is a print that recounts the last scene of a play um, performed in 1795 after the terror that used the events of the terror as its subject matter. Clothing was one of the principal markers of political identity in the revolution and the first revolutionaries replaced the breeches or culottes, um, silk stockings and fancy wigs of the aristocracy with proletarian trousers. Um, the wearers became known as sans culotte, which became a generic term for radical revolutionaries. But here, the artist David, who is hard to escape from at this time, took things to a slightly different level with this uh, commission from the Committee of Public Safety to uh, um, produce a dress for the representatives of the French people. And here he's representing Roman, Roman dress, the toga and the cloak to give dignity to public officials and in, in encourage public spiritedness. Um, and to the right, there's a there's a law, um, um, mark, uh, there's a poster um, uh, announcing the distribution of money to um, um, citizens wounded in the storming of the Tuileries Palace in 1792, showing the significant investment in the heroic deeds of everyday participants. Now, the money they'd have received would have looked like this, not quite like this. This is a sort of un Andy Warhol version of the, uh, what the individual um, uh, notes would have looked like. It's an uncut sheet of assignats. Assignats were promissory notes um, that were based on the value of land that had been claimed by the revolution from the nation, in other words, taken back from the, the clergy and the aristocracy, that then became a fully functioning paper currency. So it was really you know, politically powerful to circulate this money because it, it, you were literally owning a piece of France as it, as it circulated and reclaiming it. And, and turning the tables on the previous uh, regime. And many artists were involved in the uh, production of these, these notes. Um, and Assigna depreciated catastrophically during the terror and the result, uh, there was lots of counterfeiting and they were withdrawn in 1796. Um, and I'm just gonna show here a few more different notes and assignat and paper documents that we have in the exhibition and some medals and also a playing card right there in the center and playing cards are super interesting because what do you do with playing cards when you can't have kings and queens anymore um, you have to you have to do something else and figure out other hierarchies and other characters to be on those on those notes so this one has a slightly more abstract virtue a female allegory holding the constitution representing union um, actually, you know, makes them impossible to play cards with. So, you know, they weren't actually um, uh, used widely, but um, it's a really interesting um, piece of paper ephemeral nonetheless. Um, I'm pairing these two images, which are quite close to one another in the exhibition, because I think they do something really interesting together. Um, the image on the left is actually uh, an English image from this period. Be after the execution of the king, uh, the, the English response to the French Revolution became increasingly hysterical. Writers like Edmund Burke railing against the, uh, against the revolution. Uh, the idea that all social restraints had broken down, that chaos was gonna come to England. And so here we have this Republican bell. This is one of a pair of prints um, with daggers in her hair and skulls uh, adorning her clothing and her feet uh, bursting through her shoes like she's some kind of monstrous creature. Uh, meanwhile, there are summary executions happening in the background and she's casually shooting someone. And she has these wonderful earrings, uh, miniature guillotine earrings and a guillotine necklace, which is a, which is a nice touch. Um, and in comparison to that, um, this uh, really fine stipple engraving uh, of a Madame Sans-Culotte, which is again one of a pair of uh, a pair of images, um, which is far more uh, benign and uh, much more sympathetic. And she's patriotically dressed. She's engaged in a, you know, this patriotic work of knitting uh, a bonnet rouge, a, 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 a 
this the radical bonnet worn by the, the sans culottes. Um, and as in Finley's neon piece, there's this line of thin pale red that's again uh, very present in this in this image and becomes a theme throughout the, the exhibition. Um, and it's you know, represented a ambivalent effect here in this image that's ostensibly positive. I thought I'd show these quickly and I'm gonna want to move on, but this is, a, you know, in contrast to those, this is Marie Antoinette who's executed in 1793 and is one of a number of flattering images that she has made um, of herself. Um, uh, shortly after this print was made, um, it's a print after a miniature, um, Marie Antoinette was ex arrested with the king trying to flee the country and the tide turned against the, the royal family from that point, um, that point onwards. Um, and after their execution, we see a number of these very sentimental images, such as this one by Hodwiecki with the Louis XVI saying goodbye to Marie Antoinette and his children, these um, slightly over the top, but um, you know, in some ways very moving images of, of a, a tearful, tearful departure with Louis Charles, the Dauphin on the left hand side, and Marie, Marie Therese, his daughter in the center there. And it's Marie Therese who in the 1820s gives that statue of Louis XVI, um, or commissions that statue of Louis XVI that many years later via a circuitous route ends up in Louisville. So the terror had started by the need to combat allied European armies and to reign in a nation riven by civil war, but as the war threat reduced, people began to wonder about whether these policies of state violence needed to be continued. Um, but the very repressive atmosphere which the terror generated made it um, made this kind of debate almost impossible, um, especially as figures such as Robespierre um, was, were not enamored of a, of a move away from terror. Um, and then in, on, in July 1794, there's the coup of the so-called coup of Neuf Thermidor, um, named after a, one of the months of the Republican calendar, um, which replaces that regime. And here we see um, Robespierre, the center of this um, really large print, being shot in the jaw um, and uh, falling into the arms of Saint-Just, his uh, close supporter, um, and his brother, Augustin jumps out the window in the background. And again, those busts of revolutionary martyrs, Marin and Le Pelletier on the walls. And the following afternoon, the tribunal condemned Robespierre and 21 others to death. They were guillotined that day on the Place de la Révolution where Louis XVI had been executed the previous year and the terror came to an end. In the aftermath, a number of images were produced that were generally very negative about the, the, the terror and focused on um, its violence, its cannibalism, uh, um, such as both of these, these images. But I want to just draw attention to this one on the right hand side, this wonderful morning image, which um, features in the negative space uh, outlined by the neck of this dancing sans culotte, the profile of Louis XVI. And the text tells us that the dancing revolutionary, dancing the Carmagnol is being choked to death by this ghost from the past. And in the weeping willows in the background are the silhouettes of Madame Elizabeth, the King's brother and Marie Antoinette. So again, we come full circle and portraiture returns at the end of the, the exhibition. And I, I want to really end with this, this pair of images, um, the one on the right in particular, and these are tiny, they're about three inches in diameter and they represent pile of portraits of revolutionary figures, most of whom are dead by this point, with time scythe, uh, cutting them up, they're being blown into disarray by this, this putty at the bottom. And they're, they're portraits, just like the ones we've seen at the beginning here, where that are overlaid over Assignat, this revolutionary paper money and other documents of state and ephemeral, um, uh, you know, pieces produced by the uh, burgeoning revolutionary state during the, during the terror. But again, if we look really closely, you can see torn into the edges of some of these portraits, and you have to really look closely for this, they're small, are these clandestine signs of allegiance to the memory of the king and his profile torn into the edges of the portraits of Mirabeau and Lafayette. And down here, the Dauphin, Marie Antoinette, again, emerge like these sort of haunting figures 
trading in the memory of the revolution as something that's produced through its, its printed paper past. Just before I hand over, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. We've had a number of projects in relation to this exhibition, including teaching. Um, um, my MA students have done a number of pop-up exhibitions, and I know some of them are here now and have, have been really involved in the, the exhibition, but also some artist commissions that have tried to integrate the more historic material from the uh, exhibition with some um, more contemporary concerns and to reach new audiences. Uh, beyond the strictly academic audience that a, a university collection more, more typically reaches. And one of these uh, commissions is um, that by artist Rebecca Loweth, um, The Light Gleams and Is, gleams and is Gone, which um, takes the paper ephemera and hidden messages, those hidden word plays and silhouettes of revolutionary visual culture and gives them a twist. And this is a, a takeaway that you can, you can take with you from the exhibition um, and can be folded like a banknote to reveal and transform a line from Matthew Arnold's 1867 poem on Dover Beach. So connecting to contemporary um, political concerns as well about the borders of, of this country. And um, finally, um, we've just re received these, even despite the, uh, despite the lockdown, the, uh, uh, this set of uh, top trumps cards um, produced by um, artist Sean Curran as a special commission, a card game to introduce new audiences to the exhibition um, and to allow them to engage with the French Revolution collections at, at UCL Art Museum in, in different ways and to think about um, more playful and performative ways to think about that, that history. Um, okay, I'm gonna hand over now um, to Nicola Baldwin, who's going to introduce the, the next part of the tour. Thank you. Hi there. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Nicola Baldwin and I'm a playwright and I'm a UCL Creative Fellow this year. The Creative Fellowship Programme is a pilot programme at UCL to um, allow staff, students and researchers at UCL to work with external creative practitioners on making their work uh, appear and uh, pop up in different forms. Uh, my play, The Duchess, is based on the Witnessing Terror exhibition, and um, it is a dramatization of aspects of the letters of the Duchesse Delboeuf, who Richard mentioned in his talk a couple of times. Um, uh, she was uh, a wealthy aristocrat who remained in Paris throughout the terror. As other aristocrats fled, were arrested or executed, she stayed in her house within, um, if not spitting distance, certainly within hearing the roaring crowd distance of the guillotine itself. And um, during that period, she wrote an almost daily stream of letters which detailed her impressions and her opinions about what was going on in Paris during the terror. Um, as you've heard, these letters were discovered by chance by um, Colin Jones while he was doing some research for something else in the archive of the Paris police um, and they are now the basis of a collaborative research project between QMU, Queen Mary's where Colin um, is based, and the University of Exeter to translate these letters. Um, there is also an opportunity for members of the public to log on and have a look and see if they can decipher texts themselves at the moment but you can check that out yourselves. Um, I had a lot of help from Colin in the early stages of researching this, as well as everybody at the Art Museum, and Colin told me that um, the opinions that the Duchesse d'Elbeuf expresses in the letters would have certainly meant her death had she said them in public. Um, so uh, the play is really based on five questions, and they are Number one, how did the Duchess herself and this extraordinary cache of letters survive? Number two, um, how did the letters find their way into the hands of the Paris police without any action being taken? Who was she writing to? Why did the letters at some point cease to be letters and start to become more of a journal? And then finally, what interests me as a playwright, what was the daily life of her household and the Duchesse like during this period of lockdown? 
Um, uh, the play itself is set one night in 1793. The audience enter the home as the Duchesse d'Elbeuf in secret. And it is at a point in the terror, which Richard alluded to already, when neutrality was no longer an option. Whether or not you were a tradesman, uh, a former servant of somebody who is an aristocrat, your lives were at risk if you weren't actively supporting the revolution. So the premise of the play is that the indomitable Duchess gives us her survival tips for surviving the revolution. But in the course of the play, her two servants, who you won't see in this extract, they stage a kind of rebellion of their own. Um, the idea behind the play is really just um, my, my theory, and I think the theory that we worked on in the workshops and through visiting the exhibition ourselves, is that there is no way that the Duchess, elderly as she was, she was in her 80s uh, at the time, there was no way she could have survived without, well, had her servants denounced her, she would almost certainly have been executed. So the play imagines how the Duchess forges new relationships with her household, which in time replicate what's going on in the uh, wider society. Um, we started rehearsing this play ready for a performance that was due to take place at the UCL Lates event at the end of March. And when we were workshopping this play, none of us could imagine what it would be like to living under, living under lockdown. Uh, we couldn't imagine spending week upon week confined into your home without being able to go outside. And it's very interesting being able to revisit the play under these circumstances. And um, I hope that the words of the Duchess will make you intrigued about the play, about the exhibition, and also to reflect a bit about what crazy times we're in now. You're going to hear a short extract from the beginning of the play. And um, it's when the Duchess is regaling us with her stories of her life. What she says is based on sections from the Duchess's letters. And the, um, there is evidence in the exhibition, there is a text in the exhibition that relate to her being accused of being an emigre. The extract you're going to hear is read by Nicholas Sanderson. And the play is directed by Saskia Marland, who I think is in the room somewhere. And two actresses that you're not seeing but are in the play is Harriet Leach and Stephanie Houtman. Hope you enjoy it, thank you. Despite what people say, betraying France, etc., at least Marie Antoinette tried. If only our king had stood up to the great unwashed on day one, literally day one, of course, with this mind bobbling Republican calendar. I used to see her walk in the Tuileries where she was held prisoner. Before her execution, they shaved her head, bound her hands, the Queen of France. The King went to his death in a carriage, but she, she was paraded among the jeering crowd in a cart. Her last words were to the executioner. As she climbed to the guillotine, she stood on his foot. Pardon me, sir, she said, I did not do it on purpose. I damn well hope she did. Lesson three, ladies and gentlemen, if confrontation occurs, stand up for yourself. When I left Paris for my estates in the Somme, they called me an internal emigre in the press. I came back, I wrote, and I had it corrected. Never let a false report go unchallenged. I don't look anymore to see which of my poor friends are going to the guillotine. So, there's time to tell you about my trip to my country estate, my late husband's dukedom, Chateau des Ebeuf. It's, it's lovely in the summer, it really is. You should see it. All the trees, are, they're gorgeous. In May 1790, I had news of trouble. The farm labourers attacked my steward. I was glad to leave Paris, but on entering the town of Moray, we found ourselves menaced by insurrection. An infinite number of poor people, more and more from, from all sides, uh, like ants teeming into the streets. A tip-off came that I and my steward were to be lynched. I clambered on the market cross and I said, look here. Think of all I've done for your village, how I 
remodeled your church with splendid new windows before you start griping about bread. Think who is sowing the wheat and reaping it. If there's starvation, work harder. If you will kill me, step up the man who dares do it. No one did. <laughs> I'd said to my friends, things are so bad, I'm off to Belgium. <laughs> but after I dealt with the mob at Moray, I thought, sod bloody Belgium. I'll go back and take my chance in Paris rather than die of boredom and bad food. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. So virtual applause for uh, Nicholas Anderson. I'm going to just give a very brief intro to both the Nicholas because we didn't get a chance to say some words about who they are. So uh, as we heard, Nicola Baldwin is a writer, dramatist and a director who's, uh, who's worked in theatre, film, radio and TV and she's currently the UCL Creative Fellow um, and she's written the play The Duchess based on this exhibition. Nicola Sanderson, who's whose name appears as Nicola White on the screen. Um, Nicola Sanderson uh, may, be, may look very familiar. Um, she's done, her TV credits include uh, Peak Practice, Casualty, Coronation Street, The Bill, EastEnders and Holby City. So we have famous people in this, in this Zoom. So thank you, Nicola, we're thrilled to have you and thanks for the performance. All that is left for me to say is thank you to, thank you for all the people who attended, it's brilliant. Um, and thank you to our speakers, Nina Perlman, Richard Tours, Nicola Baldwin and Nicola Sanderson. I want to thank UCL Art Museum for putting on this brave exhibition um, and to thank UCL Culture, in particular Helen Pike, for all our hard work in putting this event together. Really lovely to work with you, Helen, and I want to do more with UCL Culture in the future years and future months. Um, and finally, if you have enjoyed this private view, do keep joining us. Sign up to our mailing list if you haven't and come back again. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the day.